Gracious God, your servants are listening. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're continuing our series on Paul's letters to Timothy. And it has struck me as we've been working through these letters uh, on how our own life experience truly colors the way that we read scripture. Because this letter from Paul, the old pro, to Timothy, the young protege, just sort of reads to me like ancient versions of email from the big boss to the middle manager. <laughs> Perhaps this is because, because uh, before coming to seminary, before coming here, I had this purely accidental career in business. Um, with this little coffee company called Starbucks. <laughs> Not sure if you've heard of it, but. Um, my relationship with Starbucks uh, began at a time in which I felt lost. After college, I worked in youth ministry, as had been my plan, and I was experiencing a lot of professional disillusionment, and uh, I was also wrestling through a personal crisis of faith. Not being sure what I believed in, it became difficult to work in a church. Most mornings, I was much more excited about stopping at Starbucks on the way to the office than I was actually getting there. And I'd spend an hour or so at this coffee shop, drinking coffee, trying to pray, and read my Bible, and figure out my life. And soon the people behind the counter that I interacted with every day uh, they knew me. They knew my name, and they knew my drink, and they knew my routine. And they'd ask me about what I was reading, or they'd ask me about what I did for a living. And they would engage with me in conversations about my own questions and doubts. And these questions and doubts were held up in this coffee shop in a very refreshing and genuine uh, way. And in the midst of what would become a difficult uh, breakup with the church, in the midst of a time in which I felt lonely and confused and displaced, I had this place, this coffee shop, where I felt welcome and known. So when I left the church, I became a barista. <laughs> and I didn't plan to stay at this job long. Um, no one ever does. Uh, <laughs> while I figured out what to do with my life. Because that should only take a few months. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a few months magically turned into 10 years. And the thing that kept me there for so long as a customer and then as an upwardly mobile employee was really simple. I had experienced the good news of Starbucks. <laughs> What they were selling, they sold to me. And after all of those years and millions of caramel macchiatos, both served and consumed, <laughs> what I learned was this. The message is everything. Starbucks mission statement goes like this. To inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, in one neighborhood at a time. This statement, <laughs> just gives you chills. <laughs> this statement was printed on the inside of the aprons that employees wear. So in case you forget, you can like look. <laughs> and it's all over the training materials and the website and everyone's business cards. And in my last store, it was actually even printed on the door of the back room so that it was the last thing you saw before you headed out to the floor to serve customers. And I wish that I could tell you that we like all slapped it and said something like, grew like a champion. <laughs> I was a believer. 
The team at one of my stores used to joke that I must bleed green. I believe that creating a place where paths cross and genuine conversations are had, where people can be honest and vulnerable, where people learn to be considerate of each other and patient with each other, and maybe even learn how to engage with people different from them. I believe that creating this place was important because it had been vitally important to me at a crucial time. A time in which I was more vulnerable than I had ever been, feeling desperately homesick for the church, the very institution that claims to have cornered the market on sacred space. And this place, this coffee shop, in the absence of certainty, felt safe and felt like good news. And I became a sort of Starbucks evangelist <laughs> because I believed that if other people could have that experience, that it would result in a contagion of good. But there were times when the mission got lost in the details of the day to day. It always seemed like on the days that I was supposed to train someone new, the devil was in those details. <laughs> we were supposed to just be able to sit, me and this new partner, and drink coffee and talk about the mission, and talk about inspiring and nurturing all these human spirits and all the good we could help create, and just smile and talk about our feelings. <laughs> And that would be the same day that someone wouldn't show up for their opening shift, or customers would be cranky, or we would run out of everything simultaneously, or a barista would fall out of a drive through window. And uh, my capacity to sit around and wait for all of these inspired and nurtured human spirits to just kick in already would be reduced to zero. And I would get the reason for all the work and all the noise. I would look around and wonder, what is the point? Eventually things would settle down and I would sit down at the table with this new kid and pour a cup from a lukewarm French press and I'd say something to the effect of, our job is to inspire and nurture the human spirit. <laughs> Some of the false teachers attempt this time 
the libertines would make this pitch. If there's grace for all, then what you do doesn't matter, so do whatever you want. Then others, in another, in another camp, the ascetic camp would say, judgment is coming. What you do is the only thing that matters, so you better get it right. Timothy finds himself in this place where these other teachers claim the name of Christ, but seem to be espousing very different ways of, belief, of living that belief out. Scripture and tradition somehow justify these other versions of the gospel. But what's the truth? This doesn't really sound like such an ancient problem, does it? Tradition is an essential component to our faith. And the scripture upon which we found our tradition is powerful. The words, the imagery, the stories are powerful. They continue to draw us back. But unfortunately, scripture and all its power can often be misused. It has been misused to justify holding people in the bondage of slavery and in the bondage of guilt. Shame. It's been misused to convince some individuals who are called to the Lord's work that they are actually better suited to sit down and stay quiet. It's been misused to displace people from the fellowship of believers because of who they are and what their family looks like and who they love. Scripture is powerful, and its power is easily mishandled. We have seen and continue to see it happen. And it created the same sort of tension and conflict in Timothy's time as it does today. Paul seems concerned that Timothy might be tempted to sell out. Perhaps Timothy might decide that tweaking his own message, watering it down a little bit, might keep him out of Paul's kind of trouble. Perhaps Timothy, rightfully afraid and lonely, might throw in the towel altogether. Maybe he'll go sleep on Grandma Lois' couch or get <laughs> a job in a little coffee shop. Paul had already been deserted by so many and had already faced a lot of heartbreak. Maybe Timothy would be no different. So Paul has been holding up Timothy's predecessors in faith as models of how to fight the good fight. But in the passage for today, he calls on Timothy to stop looking outside of himself for a moment and take a look at his own story. But as for you, all right, continue in what you have learned, what you have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying to Timothy, the gospel of Christ, which came to you through scripture and tradition, is actually good news for you. It's not some passing trend. It's not just today's headline. It is not just good for now or good enough, but it is salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. It is your salvation. It is the story of your redemption. No matter how your own ears might have itched, this has been and will remain the God breathed truth, the living word that comes to us in our brokenness, in our loneliness, in our despair and displacement, and it claims us as children of God. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ who died and was raised and will come again. It is the good news. This good news for you is truly good news for all. There are times when the message gets buried by a job that ain't easy. There are times when, in sacred spaces, we can look around and feel like everyone is bogged down in the grimy details, arguing about things that are less than essential. When we forget to look each other in the eye, and we forget that actually, yes, each one of us are vessels of human spirit that need inspiration and nurturing and comfort and rest and redemption, when we forget that, then what's the point? Why even bother 
unlocking the doors of the Because we know there is good news that is bigger than those grimy details. In my coffee shop days, when the message of inspiration and nurturing got lost, I would stop to recall the friendships that had been forged behind the counter with people that were, like me, trying to do the tough work of figuring out their lives, learning to ask the right questions. I would remember the first time someone trusted me enough to give me the keys to the store. And the first time that I handed keys to someone who had never been entrusted with anything so important. I would remember my spirit being inspired and nurtured. I would remember helping to inspire and nurture others. I could remember participating in the message and proclaiming it above the noise. We call it good news for a reason. Because it's good. We experience it in a real, tangible way. It gives us a story that we can't help but tell. We don't have to think about how to spin it so that it sounds good enough. It's not just true because somebody else tells me that it's true. Good news rings true in spite of the details. And so Paul reminds Timothy of the gospel that is good news for him. The message that had come through the scripture that he grew up with. The scripture which has complicated and easily misused as it could be and somehow been useful to him. Had equipped him for his calling. It had been useful in the hands of the community that surrounded him. It was not simply ink on a page that had trained him up in righteousness. It was the living word of God. Delivered through the sacred writings, whispered and sung and preached by voices that had experienced the power of the good news. These same voices had encouraged Timothy and answered his questions and prayed for him and with him. Paul wanted to remind Timothy what it had been like to experience the good news of the gospel of Christ. To remember his own salvation. To remember the unrelenting patience of the love of God. To remember the extravagant welcome and lavish inclusion and empowerment for good that is found only in Christ. Paul wanted Timothy to recall that in the very presence of God, in the face of judgment that deems us all lost and broken and alone, through Jesus Christ, praise God, we are forgiven, redeemed, given a place in God's kingdom and empowered to be in relationship and be good, taking this good news that has been good news for us and sharing it with the entire world, knowing that it is a story that all need to hear. Knowing that whether times are favorable or unfavorable, we have a message to proclaim. Today we as the church face the threat of competing gospels. Some use corporate culture. Some use the lure of excess capitalism. Some use science. Some use politics. Some use scripture. All of them use us. They all appeal to us to get bogged down in the grimy details of life. They appeal to us that if we are right enough, or productive enough, or free enough, that that's the good news. And if you're like me, you know that these other Gospels can be very persuasive. The good news of good business was good enough for me for a long time. But eventually, good enough isn't good enough. A system in which it's up to me and my own power to inspire and nurture isn't good enough because my patience runs out. My capacity is low. The good news has to be something bigger than me, something bigger than what I can build, what I can create, what I can make up on my own. Inspiration and nurturing with an extra shot of espresso and a 401k seems like maybe it should be good enough. But we are hardwired to long for something better than good for now or good enough. When a clever marketing spin or a mission statement isn't good enough, when you're faced
facing real disappointment and failure and fear. When it seems that you cannot do enough or be enough or ever get it right. The good news of grace awaits you. It rings true no matter who you are. Male, female, black, white, gay, straight, young, old. Grace covers all. The love of God is proven to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This relentless grace is the gospel, the good news that sustains the faithful and brings the prodigal home. What's the good news for you? God loves you and redeems you and gives you life. Proclaim that message. Because 